today as we come together in this Eucharist, brothers and sisters, also to pray for healing. It is so consoling to see that the Lord himself presents himself in the gospel as a doctor, as the one who heals. It's the word of God itself that is proclaiming Christ today as the healer. But there's a particular healing that I would like to reflect upon, and then we'll say something also on other kinds of healing, that I feel the word of God today is inviting us. It's very beautiful what we find in the first reading taken from the book of Isaiah, where the one who converts to the Lord is called as restorer of ruined houses. You know, there is a particular saint that this was his mission, and I'm sure you know who he is. Saint Francis of Assisi, the founder of my own community. <laughs> when Jesus spoke to him from the crucifix of Saint Damien, he told him, go and rebuild my church, which, as you can see, is falling into ruins. You know, there are moments in the history of the church where Jesus wants to literally restore. Listen to what the first reading tells us. You will rebuild the ancient ruins. The very same words that St. Francis heard. Go and rebuild my church. Built upon the old foundations, you will be called breach mender, restorer of ruined houses. You know, nowadays, one of the great, uh, it costs a lot of money. I mean, there are two things in the art world. You could be an artist, so you would create it, but you could restore art. And you know, the art of restoring things is very costly. Not everybody can that. When you restore, you don't recreate. When you restore, you bring to the forefront the beauty that is hidden. Now, this is what the church needs nowadays. We don't need people in the church who recreate the church, who rebuild the church by inventing a new kind of church. The real healing in the church as a community is this kind of restoration where we bring out the hidden beauty that there is. This is the beauty of the church. And you know, in fact, it says, build on the old foundations. It doesn't say restore the old foundations. What is the hidden beauty, the foundation in the church? It's the person of Jesus. This is the real healing of the church. When we become, as a Christian community, transparent to Jesus Christ. This is renewing the church in the power of the Holy Spirit. Where every Christian becomes transparent to Jesus. Now, church authorities, bishops, organizations in the church, they have their own mission also to reorganize, restructure the church from an organizational point of view. But that's not the mission of all of us. The majority of us are called to rebuild, the ch restore the ruined houses, restore the ruined church through holiness. This is the Franciscan way of restoring the church. You know, we are not called to be reformers. We, we reform the Vatican, the Roman Curia, and the diocese, and the, the bishop. This is not our way. It's not, it's not our calling. Somebody has to do it also. No, but as Franciscans, we are called from the grassroots to bring out the beauty of Christ. This is the significance of St. Francis of Assisi's stigmata. It's very different from Padre Pio. Padre Pio received the stigmata in reparation for the sins of priests, the sins of the word. St. Francis received the stigmata to show the world once again who is Jesus Christ, to become a living representation of Jesus. So Jesus crucified, who asked him, go and rebuild my church. How did St. Francis of Assisi renew the church? By becoming one with Christ, totally, to the point of sharing in his suffering, and like that, he gave Christ back to the world. The hidden beauty, he restored it back. Now, this is something that all of us are called to do. All of us can do, brothers and sisters. And believe, believe, believe that the Holy Spirit not can, but will use you to bring this kind of healing in the church. You now, the church will be truly healed not only when we ask forgiveness for the mistakes of the church, etc. That we have to do it. Justice in the church needs to be done also. But that on itself, 
will not renew the church. The church needs another thing along with this. We need men and women of God who are transparent to Jesus, who bring out once again the beauty of Jesus through a personal relationship with him. And one of the ways how we can do that, which is also the way St. Francis did it, is the way that the psalm shows us. Turn your ear, O God, and give answer, for I am poor and needy. So it's this dialogue. It's through prayer. Turn your ear, O God. It is God hearing us, but also us hearing God. As the, as the verse before the gospel said, Harden not your hearts today, but listen to the voice of the Lord. Pope Francis has encouraged us that during this land we should put the emphasis in his Lenten message to listen to the voice of God. Because real healing in the church, as a church, as a community, comes from listen, listening. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. It doesn't come from having a supernatural hype, some kind of feeling. Faith doesn't come from feelings, you know. It comes from hearing the word of God and listening deeply. When Jesus called Matthew today in the gospel, the very first thing he told him, follow me. Now, the position of a disciple in the gospel is the one who listens to the master. St. Francis, as a matter of fact, much of his prayer was listening to the gospel. In fact, in our own Franciscan rule, the very first words that he tells us, this is the life and rule of the friar miners, to live the gospel of Jesus Christ, full stop. And there he said it all. <laughs> there he said it all. You know, listening to God's word and living it, that is how we bring healing in the church, how we restore the ruined church, how we restore the ruined community. That's something that all of us can do. That is the Marian way. That is what Mary did. She heard God's word, she accepted it, and she lived it. You know, if I may say this, all of you could have this gift of healing. You can bring healing to the church if you listen to God's word and live it. And that makes you transparent to Jesus Christ. Now, Matthew, when he was called here Levi, he wasn't one of the best people. Now, Jesus just called him, and uh, you know, Matthew had a problem because it wasn't easy to accept him within the Christian community because as somebody who was a tax collector, so he allied with the Romans. Now, the Romans, remember, were great enemies of the Jews, both because of their financial issues, but also because, spiritually speaking, the Romans believed in a lot of gods, polytheists. No, they didn't have the Jewish faith. So Jesus was calling somebody coming from that periphery, our Pope Francis would say, you know, coming literally, he wants to use somebody to bring this renewal whom we might not think the Lord wants to use him. And we should have this openness even nowadays in the church, that the Lord can use those whom we think he cannot use. Or the Lord can use persons that we think they are not up to it. Now, all of us have this Matthew inside. All of us have sometimes this hidden person that from one side we cry as disciples, from another side we're attracted a little bit to the word. You know? The Lord is calling that part of us to become his disciple during land. You know? And the Lord will use even your weakness, just as he used Matthew. Because it's about him. It's not about us. How much we need to rediscover the beauty that God comes to call us when we don't expect him. He comes in unplanned ways and he surprises us. You know how much we need to discover the awe that God wants to use me and believe that all of you, the Lord wants to use you. You could be sick and bad. You could be in a nursing home. Who told you that God doesn't use old people? Who told you that God only uses the young? I mean, if you see when Joseph and Mary went to the temple, whom do they find that leads them really to, to see who Jesus is for them? Two old people, Simon and Anna. No? So there is no age group that is more usable by God. It's up to him. 
You know, give him your availability. He doesn't need your ability. He needs your availability. No? And God never chooses the qualified. He qualifies those whom he chooses. And even old people can be qualified. Even sick people can be qualified. And I would like to insist on this kind of healing because any other healing, I mean, God can heal us miraculously, all of us. But if you go to the Holy Land, do you think you will meet Lazarus? No. Now, Jesus raised him up from the dead, but he died. You know, <laughs> he died again. You know, even Talita, Jairus' daughter, will you meet her going around the Holy Land? No, she died again. So all those whom Jesus resurrected, they died again. So, yes, the Lord can do miracles. The Lord can heal us, you know, and he does. But let us desire even more that which will remain, brothers and sisters. And the church needs this kind of healing. It's the healing that comes through holiness. In other words, when we are one with Christ, listening his word, obeying him, we are restoring in a spiritual way the house of God. Not everybody might see that, but in the kingdom of God, things aren't as in the world. Things start slowly, they grow slowly. The Lord sometimes works underground. He does great things where nobody is seeing him. We need pure eyes to see God. Who saw God creating the world? Who saw the incarnation happening in the womb of, G of Mary? Who saw Jesus being resurrected from the dead? Nobody. The greatest things that God does, nobody sees them. That's the divine way of acting. Sometimes we want the boom, the hit. We have to pay attention even in the church. The church will not be renewed through big hits and big booms. You know, those make a lot of noise. But then you'll find nothing else. Whereas in your simple, ordinary lives, brothers and sisters, leading daily lives, for some people they could be unnoticeable. You might feel that you are sick in a bed, in a nursing home, alone at home, and you might feel that your life is not worthwhile. Nobody is noting you, nobody is affirming you, nobody is giving you special importance, and yet you are the ones. You are the ones. You are the ones whom the Lord is truly using in hiddenness. This is how God acts. You know, the word and sometimes the worldly aspect in the church, sometimes even in us priests, we always want to make a big hit. It is not God's way. He always starts from hiddenness. Always. Jesus, before he goes to preach, he starts from the hiddenness of Nazareth, then the hiddenness of the desert. Even Pentecost, where God did a big boom in Jerusalem, but it all started in the hiddenness of the Seneca. It starts from there. Only the Holy Spirit brought them out. They didn't go out themselves. The basic position is to hide yourself. Then he will manifest you to others. It is what Paul says in the letter to the Colossians. Your life is hidden in Christ. That is your position. If he wants to reveal you, it's up to him. If he keeps you in hiding, it's up to him. That's why we have the greatest powerhouses in the Catholic Church. Nobody sees them. They are the monks. They are the hermits. They are the cloistered nuns, which I would like to greet them. They are following us one way or another. And we should appreciate we should set ourselves free from the spirit of the word that thinks that the church will be healed and renewed through I don't know what. I truly believe in the power of weakness, in the power of simplicity, in the power of normal people, in the power of daily life. It is there that the Holy Spirit manifests itself. And this is the kind of healing that the church needs. I felt so much in my heart to, to encourage you all for this kind of healing. Then obviously, Brothers and sisters, the Lord, he is a doctor. No, he heals us, he touches us in, in every way. He could, as Christians, we have nature and grace to be healed. Even medicine, it's a gift from God. In the Old Testament, this is very important that we read what the Old Testament says about physical healing. He tells us, now I was going to become a medical doctor, so I honor doctors. But he also, because the Old Testament tells us, the book of Syrah, chapter 38, honor the physician, 
He says that the physician should consult God before prescribing medicine. <laughs> no, 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 no. If the physician doesn't do it, then do it yourself when you're sick. <laughs> Tell him, Lord, yes, give. I always pray for doctors that the Lord will give them the right intelligence to do the right interventions and give the right prescriptions. Because medicine, where does it come from at the end of the day? It comes from the earth. And who created the earth? God. God created, naturally, the remedies we need for our healing. Every medicine comes from the earth. You know? So even that. The Lord then, through his gifts, through his manifestations of the Spirit, through the power of the sacraments, the Eucharist, confession, the anointing of the sick, through the power of the Word of God, Jesus healed many times through his Word. You know, I always invite sick people, get a psalm, like Psalm 103. You know, it, it blesses God as the one who heals all your diseases, etc. And when you're sick, just read the Word of God and allow the power of God's Word to do its healings and miracles as he wants in you. The word of God, it's creative and it heals. The Old Testament says he sent his word and healed them. You know, so sometimes even when you cannot go to mass, you cannot receive the Eucharist because of one reason or another, you cannot have the sacraments. You can always have God's word with you. And as Catholics, we need to rediscover the power of the word of God that brings so much healings in our lives. And uh, when we pray for healing, once I was tempted to stop praying for healing, I have to be honest with you. You know why? Because I, I suffer a lot for those who aren't healed. For me, it's a mystery why some are healed and why some aren't. I don't understand it. And I suffer a lot. You know, sometimes even when I have a healing mass or healing service and people come up giving testimony, it's very beautiful. We clap, we praise God. I forget them immediately. I always think of those who will go back with their sufferings. Those remain in my heart. Those. It's very painful to see somebody heal and you aren't healed yourself. So once I was tempted not to pray anymore because I felt so much compassion for these people. No? But then as I was praying, I felt the Lord giving me this sense in my heart. Hayden, do you pray for healing because of who you are or because of who I am? Because of who you are, because you feel compassion for the sick or for those who are sick. Or because I am, I am a healer. Then leave it up to me. We pray for healing because of who he is. Not because we have in a particular gift. Not because we have an extraordinary faith. Not because we are something special. Because of who he is. Everything is about the Lord. He is whom he says he is. And the book of Exodus, it says, I am the Lord, your healer. Now, the power of God, when he heals us, doesn't only manifest itself by removing the pain and suffering, but it can manifest itself, because God is God Almighty, by transforming that suffering into something positive. Uniting it with the cross of Christ, with the passion of Christ, it can, our suffering, attain the beauty of saving souls. It's become an act of love. United with Christ, truly our sufferings can become an act of love. So healing is not only the elimination of pain and suffering, but is the healing of pain and suffering in itself, giving it a new meaning in Christ. Remember what Paul says in his letters, we live for the Lord, we die for the Lord. The Christian life is always in Christ. So whether we are healed or whether we are not healed, none of them is important. The important is to be in Christ. If you are healed, that healing is not for yourself. That healing is for the community. It will become a testimony of the risen Lord. If you aren't healed, even that not being healed, it's not for yourself. Your sufferings will become a testimony of the crucified Christ. It's always, that is the Christian life. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. How much I desire. This is a church even here in Ireland. We will rediscover this intimacy with Jesus that will bring real renewal, real restoration of the ruins of the church. So, Christ brothers, as we now pass to the liturgy of the Eucharist, 
we're going to receive this Jesus and we allow him to transform everything that there is within us in the community in himself and let him manifest himself the way he wants. Thank you.